Hi everyone, Heather here with Astrology with Heather.com and I am back with my teacher and mentor, Robert Phoenix. Hi, Robert. Hello, Heather. <laughs> Always great to be with you. It's good to be with you too. Um, and so today we're going to be talking about the lunar month that starts on October 8th with the new moon in Libra, um, which leads up to a really intense and powerful full moon in Taurus, which is actually going to be in, in a conjunction with Uranus. Um, and we're going to kind of get into all of that. But before we get into all of that, I do just want to make a quick announcement. Um, Robert and I are going to be doing a webinar all about uh, Jupiter moving into Sagittarius and the nodes shifting signs into Cancer and Capricorn, and that's going to be live on October 20th. And if you sign up now, you get $10 off the webinar. The price will go up after you know the live webinar and all of that. So you can find that in, in the description of this video below. And um, Robert, do you have anything you want to say about like the webinar and what we're going to be doing before we get into everything else? <laughs> all, all I can say about it is it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And if you, if you don't attend, you're going to be missing out. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, in all seriousness, um, I'm really looking forward to it because um, mostly in part, because I've got, I've got a strong connection with Jupiter and Sagittarius in my chart. And I can already kind of feel it sort of creeping up on my ascendant. <laughs> and um, so I've got some insight into Jupiter. And I think this is a really – uh, you know, we always talk about personal empowerment and what we can do in order to make our lives better. Well, when Jupiter is in its own sign, there's a real opportunity to do that and to understand things at a deep and profound, life-changing, philosophical, religious, and spiritual level. So the changes that you can make this year are far-reaching and deep and profound. And one of the things that people don't quite understand all the time about astrology um, is that, of course... There are cycles that, you know, heighten or, or give us a, a bit more challenge in our lives. And we, you know, in the material physical world, it helps as a navigational tool. But astrology also connects us up to the deepest parts of who we are, i.e. our soul. So when we go through really important cycles, like a Jupiter transit in Sagittarius, this is soul food. And I think people could really, you know, benefit from understanding where Jupiter is going to be in their charts and we're going to get into all of that. And then from the perspective of the true node and the south node or the north node and the south node, it's going to be a really big deal. This one is going to be a game changer coming off of the, the true node in, uh, in Leo, which is all about solar energy and Apollonian figures and the movement in some ways to the Apollonian model. Now we come into the lunar phase with the true node in Cancer and uh, representing its uh, kind of own planetary alignment in many ways. And on the opposite side of that, the south node in Capricorn, and you know, could we be seeing the deconstruction of Capricornian entities in our lives, i.e. governments, perhaps money, and big business? And how can you prepare for something like that? Because we all know cancers love to be prepared. They like to have their, their food stocked with all kinds of goodies and um, things that are on hand. And you know, we're not pretending disaster, but you want to take care of your emotional life, you want to be able to secure yourself, sustain your life and people that you're with. So this is going to be a very pivotal time when these nodes shift. And between just those two aspects alone, the nodes and Jupiter, and I'm sure we'll touch in on some other things, I think we'll have plenty of, plenty of meat on the bone for folks. Absolutely. I, I love everything that you just said. Very well put. And I'm really excited to hear your perspective on all this during the webinar as well. Um, and the, the North and South nodes, they dictate where the eclipses are. So this is going to dictate where a lot of the really faded karmic predestined sort of transformative experiences are going to be happening in people's lives for the next you know year and a half. And so on an individual level, you know, we'll get into all of that for everyone, but it's going to sort of show where a lot of the big major events are going to be taking place. So I think it's really important to sort of focus in on those nodes because when you're looking at the lunar nodes it's usually something that's faded it's something that's going to be happening sort of regardless you know when you talk about astrology you kind of have to look at fate versus free will and with the lunar nodes and with the eclipses it's usually fate is sort of taking taking the lead in this one so um yeah i always find the the eclipses to be very interesting and very eventful <laughs> right and we also have to throw in the fact that these eclipses are going to be occurring around cancer and Capricorn, and Pluto is going to be a big player. Yeah, and Saturn. Right, so these are not going to be just your run-of-the-mill sort of eclipse seasonal moments in time. These are going to be really big uh, Titanic um, lunar phases and solar phases. So we're going to get into a lot of that 
and um, have, having some information on hand ahead of time, I think can be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so sign up for the webinar and <laughs> we'll, we'll talk more about that later. Um, but yeah, let's get into the new moon in Libra, which is happening on Monday. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be in a sort of a loose square with uh, with Pluto, um, kind of tight, but not, not super tight. And um, let's see, I'm gonna pull up the chart here so we can look at it. So new moon in Libra, bringing us back into balance. <laughs> what do you think about this new moon, Robert? I actually like this new moon a lot, um, considering that it's conjunct my moon by about one degree. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that this moon is happening. The thing I like about this moon is, uh, yes, there, there is that, you know, three degree orb, the square with Pluto. And, you know, when we get into moon Pluto squares, which you, know, you have quite a bit of insight into in terms of sort of emotional obsession and ties and going deep into sort of where your fears are about, you know, being, being abandoned or let go or being consumed, whatever those kinds of Plutonian energies portend. The cool thing about this eclipse is number one, you get to face it. You get to kind of go through some of this material. Um, and at the same time, there's some interesting um, kind of relief. And the relief that we were talking about uh, before the show is the Sabian symbol for, mm, for yeah. this moon. And um, why don't we just get right into that Sabian symbol? Because I think as it relates to sort of the, the intensity and the potential, you know, heaviness of, um, of the Libra moon, that there's a real, there's a, an opportunity here to um, be able to work with it in a way. It's a reconstructive versus a deconstructive kind of energy. So the Sabian symbol is, um, let me see if I can find it again. I've got to get out of the main screen here if I can do this. Have it right here. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. You're the best. So it's, um, it's after a storm, a boat landing stands in need of reconstruction. Right. And so this is the Dean Rudger interpretation. And uh, he says the need to keep an operation steady links between the vast unconscious, which we could actually, I believe, um, associate with Pluto. Pluto mm -hmm. would be the vast unconscious. Yeah. And, <laughs> I was just thinking and, that. Yeah. And ego consciousness, which is, in a lot of ways, our emotions and how we feel about them and how we identify with them. So, do um, you want to read this? you want to read this paragraph? The par you want me to read it out loud? Yeah, go for it. I think this is a good, good thing. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. Um, so, it says, confrontation with broad issues of relationship and currents of energies released by man's contact with archetypal spiritual realities often result in temporary destruction. Boats normally link distant regions or enable men to draw food from the sea, i.e. new relations, new realizations which so far existed only in the unconscious realm of the planetary mind. They may, al be, also, they may also be used to enjoy temporary excursions and the feel of water and the waves. Any cultural, cultured society, however, may be wary of the danger inherent in venturing far away from the consciously defined and socially structured ways of life. Such adventures may indeed turn destructive. The points of contact between the vast unconscious and the ego consciousness molded by cultural assumptions and rituals may be wrecked by psychotic storms. The boat, the boat landings must, be, uh, must then be slowly reconstructed. This is the first stage in the 40th fold sequence of cyclic phases in human experience. It brings us vividly the realization that whatever men build in order to be able to venture away from solidly individualized and conscious bases of operation is likely to be damaged by as yet unfamiliar cosmic forces. The tenuous link between the two realms constantly needs repair. Right. I like uh, the psychotic I, storms. That sort the, of fits. <laughs> the psychotic storms, which are related to Pluto, Pluto, uh, Pluto um, moon square, lunar, lunar Pluto square, right? So, so to me, this represents the ability to put things back together, mm -hmm. to patch things back together, to have a semblance of balance that can come out of a very intense encounter with one's emotions. Yeah. And I, and I also like the fact that, that Mercury is also in Libra. And uh, even though it's in kind of a, kind of, it's not really why, but it is in opposition to Uranus. That means things can happen quickly, that you can, you can find balance, you can find some level of equilibrium and find solutions, especially if you're willing to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. 
So let's say, for instance, you're in a relationship um, and there's not a lot of definition. Maybe the relationship at one time was intimate um, and the intimate part has been put on the back burner and you're now kind of more in sort of a, a, a friend or sort of a deeper friend kind of place. Uh, you can actually repair that relationship and not feel so attached to what you had before, right? So, so th there's an opportunity to kind of move things from one state to another on an emotional level here and getting outside of how you think about relationships, I think can be very important during this new moon. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you could, so this is, I mean, obviously something where, um, you know, people might be having a really intense experience as well on an emotional level, and that could be very transformative. And especially thinking about um, what has been going on the past couple of weeks and the way that people, you know, especially women have been triggered by the events that have been happening currently, especially in the United States with Venus stationing to go retrograde in, you know, Scorpio kind of makes sense what's been going on. But thinking about the way that a lot of people have been triggered, I think that this is probably going to bring up a lot of really intense emotional content for a lot of people to be working through. Um, and when you're thinking about Libra, right, it's the balance between the sexes, it's the balance between the ma masculine and feminine energy. So maybe uh, this could help us to heal through a lot of these old wounds, these old sort of baggages, these old traumas that are coming up and to come back into balance, right, to come back into a space of equilibrium where, um, you know, everybody's getting what they need and what they want, um, you know, on that sort of level, because things have been a little off kilter and a, lot, a little off balance lately, and especially with all of that emotional content that's been floating around out there. So you know, I'm wondering if this is going to be something that will either trigger a little bit more or um, help us to sort of heal through some of this stuff, or maybe a combination of both. It's probably a combination of both. If you look at Mars, Mars is in square with Venus, and it's in square with Uranus, even though it's kind of wide with Uranus. So we've got this T-square going on, mm -hmm. which to me has been the constant drama that's been brewing before <laughs> Brett Kavanaugh went to Washington, D.C., and somehow Christine Blasey Ford managed to get on an airplane. And so we've been dealing with this really kind of intense, you know, conflict between the masculine and the feminine. And the Iranian piece has, has been and will be continue to be sort of part of the deal as Venus begins to move backwards and he goes retrograde and gets closer into opposition um, with Uranus. And to me, anytime Uranus is in the mix, it's a wild card. And you don't really know sort of how it's going to show up. You know, there could be shocking revelations mm -hmm. um, around Uranus. There could also be the potential for really instantaneous and flash healing if people are open to it. I mean, the energy is uh, spontaneous and combustible. So there's, there's, there's a lot of tension here still in this chart, right, with this Venus-Mars card. Now, next week, I believe they're going to vote on the Kavanaugh um, uh, a placement or appointment to the Supreme Court. Interesting. And, and if he actually becomes uh, the next Supreme Court justice, which it's looking more and more like that's going to happen now, um, if that's going to take place, then we're going to need this Sabian symbol for the moon to really come into play because yeah. there's a there's a potential that we might see something along the lines of that 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 psychotic storm that Rudyard's talking about, yeah. which would be people losing losing their minds because of it. It's not the best thing in the world to lose your minds over people. There are bigger issues and fishes in the world, and I know it, it really hits people in a very personal place. But trust me. There's, we got bigger storms on the horizon, and this one, this one we can weather, okay? Um, that's not to say that people aren't going to have feelings about it. If that's what you choose to do, that's fine. But at least there's some potential here with this Sabian symbol that says there can be the semblance of some kind of repair. And that would be actually the adult thing to do, right? Come across the aisle, shake hands, and say, hey, we gave it our best shot. You know, Jeff Flake, you gave it your best shot, however you feel about that guy. And then you move on and say, okay, let's try to bring the country kind of back. So could this be an event where the country could actually come back together a little bit? I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. There's a chance that it may not. There's a chance that there may be a doubling down in some ways. So we'll have to see how that goes. But I think that, that at the very least, we're looking at a very intense Venus-Mars square Mm -hmm. with uh, and, and also with Mars squaring Uranus in the opposition and that's all happening on the new moon 
and that's going to electrify everything. Yeah, because that Venus square Mars, it's almost exact on the day of the new moon. It comes exact to the minute on uh, on the tenth, which would be what like Wednesday. So it'd be interesting. I'm not sure what day they're planning on making that decision uh, with the Kavanaugh thing, but I mean, <laughs> if it occurs on Wednesday, right, the second Mars um, square to your or to Venus while Venus is retrograding in Scorpio, that's going to be quite intense. It's like the battle of like the sexes. It's like um, you know squaring off between the masculine and feminine energy. All the while, this new moon is trying to bring us back into balance, and it's gonna. I think it's gonna be having a little bit of a hard time of like doing that and bringing us to that reset and that repair just because of the conflict that's going on in the chart at the same time. Um, and then that Pluto, I mean, I love Pluto transits when they're uh, positive transits because they're so deeply healing and restorative and regenerative and empowering. But when they're squares, they usually bring crisis and it's because people really need to leave, let, let, let things go. And I've noticed, especially like with working with clients and things like that, when they have difficult Pluto transits, when they're suffering, it's because there's something that they need to let go of on a psychological and emotional level. And they're just holding on for dear life. And that's usually the cause of the suffering. And so with this square, it's like there's something that we need to let go of in order to come back into balance. It's something that we're holding on to on that deep psychological, like emotional, intense level. And we're just holding on to it and holding on to it and I think the people that are going to have a hard time with this new moon and with this experience are going to be the ones that are not willing to let go of their emotional attachments to whatever it is that's going on you know externally um and so that's just kind of my sense. So in order to achieve that healing and that rebuilding and that repair, there's also a need to deconstruct and to let go of, you know, past trauma, past experiences, past connections uh, that are sort of preventing us from doing that. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And um, and I really feel like, you know, on, on, a, on a social level, you know, a lot of people, I get, you know, after we do these things, I get emails from people and they say that they love what we do. And can, can you talk about other countries sometimes? Yeah, a lot of people ask me that too. <laughs> yeah, so, so I promise we're going to do that. We will do that. Maybe the next time we get together, we'll plan some stuff out mm -hmm. um, so that we can pay attention to like the EU or, you know, another country that is outside of the United States. Um, however, for this, this broadcast or this transmission today, we are going to focus on this a little bit because what's happening here in this country as it relates to both the masculine and the feminine and mm -hmm. uh, men and women, this is a planetary event in a lot of ways. H however, that said, when we look at Libra, right, what do we have with Libra? We have the scales of justice. Yeah. And you know, when we think about justice, we think of social justice. And we think of somebody's got to either win or lose, and you know, the scales tip one way or the other. And I feel like, what we're going to have to move through, and I think this is a planetary piece, but I, I feel like the, the fulcrum of it is happening right here in this country right now, is getting over the need to be right. And there are times where it's like, and we all have our, you know, we all have our peace around it. And how many times have you gone onto Facebook and said, you know, I've got to show that person that I'm right. <laughs> you know, I got to get back on my keyboard and I got to, I got to find this quote. And <laughs> And I feel like when we get into these squares, because it's not just the moon, but the sun is squaring Pluto too at the same time, right? So we, so we get into this Libra dynamic of balance and the scales of justice and one tipping one way, one tipping the other way. And there are people who believe that, you know, that the scales of justice should really be radically recalibrated and have an imbalanced kind of you, um, you know, perspective. But I think this time if we were really cool and clear-headed, it offers up the ability to let go of the need to be right. And, and, I, and I feel like so many people now are convinced that they, they have to have their, their point of view reaffirmed uh, in a way that is ironclad and, and so that they can feel safe in a lot of ways or they can feel vindicated, whatever those things are. And I feel like we're gonna be pushed here with these squares. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I also feel like the potential to uh, resolve it is there if we can begin to let go of having to win or be right and kind of, you know, shake each other's hands to some extent. I'm not sure if it'll happen, but I feel like this is the energy that, that is available to us if we're, if we're available to it. No, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
and there is it's it's really interesting like this chart there's a lot of symbolism going on here in the astrology between that like masculine and feminine like balance and imbalance because you even have the new moon which is the sun and the moon coming into conjunction the sun mm -hmm. is like the more masculine principle the moon is the more feminine principle and libra coming back into balance um and then with that that pluto that is like holding on to something and it could be holding on to your ideas your ideals or that need to be right right and then that that's the thing that could be causing suffering for a lot of people um so yeah i think that's that's pretty spot on um it's you, yeah you know what's interesting also about this chart is that you uh, libra tends to be the gateway between the personal and the transpersonal so when we look at this chart and we see the sun, we see the moon, we see Mercury. Like by the end of the year, Mars will, will be in Pisces. Okay, so that's where Mars will be. Mm -hmm. and just about every other planet will be either in Scorpio, Sag, Capricorn, or Pisces. So we're way out there. We are way out into the collective at, from this point forward, right? because we're gonna have Venus retrograding into Scorpio. It goes back for a little bit in Libra, but then it moves ahead. We've got Saturn in Capricorn, Pluto in Capricorn, Mars in Aquarius. Mars will be in Pisces until December. The yeah. sun is gonna move on, Mercury's gonna move on. So all these planets now are pushing deeper into the collective and deeper into this transpersonal realm. So this new moon is kind of like the last chance for gas in a lot of ways. You know, like you're headed to, to Reno and you've got like 75 or 80 miles to get, you know, this is your last. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is like a, a dire consequence, but if you look at where Libra is and the role the, that it performs and the function it performs, it, it, it's creating balance between the lower half of the chart and the upper half of the chart. Yeah. That's what its function is. And after this new moon, with the exception of a brief retrograde with Venus, everything pushes up into the transpersonal. So that, that's actually a pretty significant uh, movement in terms of planetary energy, because it's all about out there. Yeah. And, and, we, and people will be, I believe, deeply triggered and, and really connected to external events. So one of the things that you could do with this new moon, because you know people like to program stuff with the new moon, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you can program this new moon is to figure out how you can maintain balance over the next three months, because I think it's going to yeah. be really important. Especially with like the way that the full moon is looking and the end of October is looking, I think coming, <laughs> maintaining that sense of balance and composure is going to be really important. And that I, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. All of these planets are going to be in these transpersonal signs and even Libra. It is, it's about balancing your own self interest and the needs of other people. Right. So that's mm -hmm. like that last point. Um, what's interesting though, is that the only planet that's in a personal sign is going to be Uranus. So this is a lot of disruption on a personal level based on everything that's going on externally. That's right. Thanks. Uranus was hiding out in the 12th house and I forgot to. Yeah. That's over. the but only planet good. that's going to be in a more personal sign. That's, that's right. Isn't that interesting? Taking up our foundation while all of this craziness is going on out there. Um, so yeah. yeah. So do you want to get into some of the stuff that's happening later on in the month? Cause we have, let's, we let's about look at it. Yeah. Mars. Let's look at it. Yeah. Let's look yeah. At it. So after, um, there's, there's a little bit of a lull, there's Mercury's doing some stuff, you know, and Venus is still retrograding until we get to the end of this month, uh, when the sun moves into Scorpio and we have a full moon in Taurus conjunct Uranus. And so that's going to be happening on October 24th. And I'll pull up the chart for this. And what's interesting about this full moon in Taurus is first off, the sun is almost, you know, in an exact conjunction with Venus retrograde in the sign of Scorpio. Um, but in the same week we have like... We have the sun conjuncting retrograde Venus this week. We have uh, the Uranus conjunct the moon for the for the full moon. We have an opposition happening between uh, Venus and Uranus this week as well. And then we have Venus at its closest point to the Earth that it's going to be for the next like two and a half years. So the Venus energy is super, super strong. It's going to be really bright in the skies, but it's going to be lit up in the charts with all of this like crazy Uranus action going on here. And it's being triggered in multiple ways because we also have the full moon triggering it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what's interesting is that Venus retrogrades back into Libra and opposes Uranus on the 31st of October, which is, you know, Samhain, Day of the Dead, Halloween, all, all Hallow's Eve, whatever you want to call it. But it's a day when historically and throughout, you know, 
thousands of years of tradition, it's a day when the veils are known to be thin. And so <laughs> we're having a lot of weird energy happening on that day. So, um, I mean, to me, I feel like this is going to be a lot of a lot of interesting chaotic energy. And with Venus being involved, you know, in Scorpio and with Uranus and Taurus, I think that this could be a disruption on a financial level. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering what you think about that because the mundane stuff is a little bit more in your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah, I think this, isn't this like the last month that Venus rises before the sun? Isn't it, isn't that, isn't this the last month of the rising? Venus is, Venus is rising, um, I think at sunset right now. Is it at sunset? Okay. So Venus is rising. It's, so it's, it's no longer, so, okay. So it's no longer the, uh, the morning star. It is ahead of uh, the, uh, of the sun here. Oh wait, no. Is. Yeah. So it is actually ahead of the, so Venus would be rising right after the sun in this, okay. in this chart. In this chart. So right but, after. Well, it, yeah. Cause Oh, the Venus, the Venus conjunction to the sun happens on, Oct on October 26th. So that same week. So it goes from being the evening star to the morning star in the same week that all that other Venus stuff is happening. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. All right. So, um, yeah, look at where all the planets are. This is exactly what I was talking about. We have the Sun in Scorpio, Venus in Scorpio, Mercury, Jupiter in Scorpio, then Saturn in Cap, Pluto in Cap, um, Mars in Aquarius, Neptune in Pisces. So this is that transpersonal phase. Now the Moon um, takes on, to some extent, even its own transpersonal quality by the conjunction of Uranus, right? We have a little animal back there. Who is, my cat. Who, is, who is that? That's my cat. She has like a little cat tent and somehow she got it from all the way to the other side of the room and now it's in the screen. So she wants to show you. She wants to show you. It's an you important can watch moment. my cat play in the background, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So this is exactly what I was talking about. And it's interesting that you bring up the, the financial piece because we're dealing with two very specific um, signs that deal with money and other people's money. Yeah. And, and it's this, the energy here, hmm. I would say it's disruptive. The energy is disruptive, but it's more of a wake up call. This is what I, this, it's not like a square where there's like a real crisis, right? And all of a sudden, everybody's running around trying to do, you know, trying to, you know, buy gas or whatever. This is a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is setting up something in the future. Like, perhaps when we get into um, May, when, when, the, when the moon flips around and it's going to be full in Scorpio, opposing Uranus, I feel like that this is uh, – it's not – I don't think this is a tectonic financial event, mm -hmm. but it does feel like a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. it's, sort, it's sort of like when you're in California and you have your first earthquake and then, you, and then you realize you don't have any flashlights, you don't have any of that stuff, you go run to the store. That's what it feels like to me. Interesting. Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a, a major, a major, I would, I would, I would feel like the, major crisis would be would be a square or maybe setting up the culmination of this which would happen probably in may with the full moon in scorpio potentially um yeah, yeah. but i think it's a wake-up call for sure that's yeah. what i think and of course you know we've been dealing you know when uranus went into uh taurus man it, it was like it was like a lesson in astrology being played out before our eyes Mm -hmm. We had the volcano in Hawaii. We had earthquakes all along the Ring of Fire. Um, Yellowstone was sort of shuddering. So it's calmed down a bit since it first started. Yeah. But this could be yet another cycle of seismic activity as well mm -hmm. as, you know, seismic economic activity. It's very powerful. We, on an emotional level, there's a lot going on here with that Moon-Uranus conjunction. Yeah, it's very disruptive. Moon your ass conjunction is like emotions just kind of all over the place. It's very hard to, even in the sign of Taurus, if you have like moon and Taurus with Uranus there, it's very hard to get your emotional bearings and to feel like grounded and stable in your emotional experience when you have that conjunction. Um, I have lots of clients and some friends who have this. And so when they're a little, even a little bit off kilter emotionally, everything is in chaos. It's like a, their emotions just turn everything into this big chaotic experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like a lot of people might be, you know, 
feeling this in a way that could be a little bit chaotic, a little bit unsettling, a little bit ungrounding and destabilizing. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about what you were saying about the financial stuff too, is that Uranus is like, is like independence, right? And in the sign of Taurus, it's like hard assets and things like that. So Uranus isn't just um, disruption and rebellion and all that. It also has an association with independence. When you look at Venus, it's interdependence and it's in the sign of Scorpio, which is other people's money. It's investments. It's like mm -hmm. not hard assets. It's like liquidated assets or whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. So there could be some sort of something going on um, around this time period involving investments or the stock market or assets or um, even like prices of like hard assets like gold and silver and like, you know, actual tangible resources and things like that. I think that that could be part of the disruption and people looking at their independence financially versus their inter interdependence and their dependence on other people and these other sort of um, uh, financial realms and things like that. If, if that makes sense, like debt, right? Because that's- Oh, it, it makes total sense. And this is where Saturn comes into play because yeah. Saturn is in trine with the moon and Uranus and- That's sex. the good part of this. It's going to bring some stability. <laughs> well, here's what I think. I mean, it, it feels to me like, and I've been, you know, and I've done a bunch of stuff on the Kavanaugh and uh, Blasi Ford hearings. And a lot of it has to do with the death of Dionysian culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, calling out Kavanaugh for, for drinking. I mean, it went from, you know, sex to, you know, drinking and passing out. I mean, these are all aspects of Dionysus. And we're, we're in the season right now of Dionysus and Bacchus. We're, we're, in, the, we're in the harvest season. We're in the Oktoberfest, right? And so this is when, you know, these, this, this kind of relationship with these spirits, both um, sort of mythical and the spirits we imbibe, come to fruition. But what we're seeing here is kind of like, you know, the, the hashtag me too is playing the role of the maintenance who ripped Dionysus to shreds because it was time for Dionysus to die. It was the end of the harvest season mm. moving into winter and Dionysus is resurrected again in the spring in some ways, right? This is part of, part of the myth. Yeah. But what, what I, what I've been sort of tracking is that, this is sort of the end of the prolonged adolescence that started in the mid sixties and uh, the summer of love and all the sort of Dionysic references to culture that have been a part of that time. And in a lot of ways, Dionysus is the eternal youth who, who doesn't, you know, it's not like a, it's not a Dionysus is a, is a prayer and, and it's through the consumption of alcohol and sex and all this that it stays young theoretically never mm -hmm. wants to grow up. And what's happening now is I, I believe we're seeing the end of that. That cycle is coming to an end. And, and, it's, and we're watching this kind of unfold before our very eyes. And this is where Saturn comes into play because Saturn is, is providing some support here with these aspects, this opposition. And it feels like we have an opportunity to interact with whatever is happening, whether it's this, this full moon or what's moving forward from a more mature, solid, informed place where perhaps our emotions aren't as explosive. You know, perhaps we can like ground ourselves and say, okay, I've got to deal with this somehow. I cannot let this excess uh, emotion or excess energy or these excessive psychic drives dominate my existence. Mm -hmm. And it feels like this is where we're headed. We've got Saturn in Capricorn, Pluto in Capricorn. It is time for all, for us to all grow up as much as we are probably not really crazy about that. Because if we don't grow up, we're going to let the so-called grown-ups run the planet. And quite frankly, they're not doing a very good job of it. So this, this is our, this is, I think an opportunity that if something does come up, that if there is a crisis on an emotional level, on a personal level, on a collective level, you can tap into the Saturnian energy and be your own best parent. That's, that's how I'm seeing this. Absolutely. That's very, very, that's very interesting. Um, and so your association with like the Dionysus thing brought up in my mind, another association. And I kind of want to, um, I kind of want to get into it. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> if you don't mind that, because yeah, um, there's a similar sort of connotation with the death and rebirth and the cycles of like maturity and, and growth and all of that, that has to do with Persephone. And this is her time of year too. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is the time during Libra season and during uh, the, the fall equinox, that's, you know, the Elysian mysteries and all of that, that have to do with Persephone and Demeter. And then, you know, at Samhain, she goes into the underworld and that's where she stays until spring and comes back out. And so when I was thinking about what's going on with the Me Too movement and with Venus stationing to go retrograde, I was contemplating this idea of victimization versus empowerment, right, with mm -hmm. Venus in retrograde. So this is a time period when we can choose to be victims, we can choose to feel triggered, we can choose, you know, that way, which would be Persephone being dragged into the underworld and raped and held hostage, or we can choose to become empowered, right? We can choose to become queens. We can be the queen of the underworld. That's the other version of Persephone, the other variation. After she learns and goes through those cycles and goes through that trauma and she becomes empowered and she starts to lead the way for others, right? She starts to become the queen of the underworld instead of this sort of maiden who's helpless and, you know, is just doing what everybody else tells her to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's an association, I would say, with Venus going retrograde and Venus being in the sign of Scorpio with that sort of idea of victimization versus empowerment. And with Saturn there, it's kind of like this time for, um, I think as a collective for us to kind of grow up and to take responsibility for ourselves and to move into that phase of empowerment, right? Instead of always playing that victim role, which also has an association obviously with that Chiron moving back into Pisces. And we were talking about that when we talked about Chiron back, you know, a quite a few months ago, but how Chiron and Pisces was sort of the, the age of the victim, right? Where we're mm -hmm. elevating the victim and praising the victim. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that there's anything wrong with, I mean, if you're victimized by, you know, sexual assault or any sort of trauma, that's not obviously your fault. And I'm not saying that that is, but there's a point where we need to stop crying and playing victim. And when we need to start taking this experience and using it into something, using it for something where we can empower ourselves and empower others and do something with that experience right and that's part of scorpio scorpio uh is really intense sort of suffering and psychological trauma and all these different things but scorpio also is transformation and it's empowerment and so with venus being in scorpio and retrograding here i think it's a time when a lot of women are going to be starting to think about how they can empower themselves in their own lives and i do think that with that saturn <laughs> association going on too it's time to kind of grow up right it's time to uh, stop being the little girl stop being the victim and start being the queen <laughs> and start taking back control of our own lives and what's going on in the collective yeah um, I, I i think that's a really really great analogy and um you know, I'm old school, and <laughs> I mean, when I when I do my broadcast and stuff, I can be pretty transparent, you know, and pretty open. And I've shared aspects of my life with people, uh, for better or worse. But the real stuff that I'm working on, nobody knows about. You know, that stuff happens in private. That stuff happens in a deep place. You know, that's where you're talking about the underworld. Yeah. You know, that's where the real transformation occurs. And, and I feel like, um, and, I, and, I, and I, look, I don't, I don't want to take away from somebody's revelation or moment, especially if somebody's an out and out creep, um, they probably need to be out it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to say that everybody in hashtag me too is somebody who's like an Asia Argento, you know, wants to, you know, sort of use it for their own, their, their career or their ego or whatever. But I also believe that, the real deep psychological and spiritual work is done in private and it's worked on and the shadow is faced and, you know, there is a kind of a, a, a much more profound relationship with archetypes and, and getting into a spiritual place of ultimately forgiveness because nothing ever gets healed without any kind of forgiveness period and the story, mm -hmm. right? Forgiveness is the period. That, that, ends a, that ends a life sentence, right? I mean, that's what happens. So I just feel like it would be, I don't know. I, I feel like the, that the outer work or what's going on and being pushed out into the world would be representative of Venus going backwards and retrograding and going deeper and back into a more personal place. Yeah. In a private place with the stuff. Because I think that's where the real deep change happens. Like I said, I don't, you know, there are people that need to be exposed and I'm okay mm -hmm. with them being exposed, but I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. And what was, what does it look like to you? I'm just curious as a woman for you, what does it look like 
to be empowered? How does how does that look and feel? I mean, I <laughs> it looks like um, well, I I mean, I would say that to be empowered looks like taking control of your own life, your own experience, and not blaming others for your circumstances. And it's kind of like being responsible in, in a way, right? It's about taking responsibility for your own life and what you're doing with it. Like everybody's given different circumstances. Everybody's gone through traumatic experiences. Most women have been harassed, raped, abused, sexually you know, traumatized in some sort of way. Uh, that doesn't mean that that has to color who you are out in the world. That doesn't mean that has to be part of your identity, right? Like take that experience and use it to make yourself stronger, take responsibility for what you're doing now, right? Instead of living in the past and in those past experiences. And I think it's, I think a lot of it's about self-responsibility, right? And like not just falling into this victim mentality. Sometimes, yeah, it sucks that you can't, that you don't see justice, right? Most people, rape victims, they don't, they don't see justice. The ones that come forward, it's like 0.01% of these rape cases actually get prosecuted. And so, yeah, it sucks, right? It's not fair. It's, it doesn't, it doesn't work out in our favor for most of the, most of the time, but that doesn't mean that we have to sit and wallow in that, right? Uh, we should be doing something. We should be, you know, moving forward in a positive way. So, um, I don't know, I guess, oh, there's my cat. Right in time. <laughs> moving forward in a positive way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't know what the, how to answer that question, what it looks well, like. I think you did a good job of answering. I think it's about taking responsibility for your experience. I mean, yeah. and look, as much as I really enjoy getting into a rabbit hole, um, hold on one second. As much as I enjoy getting into a rabbit hole and going down you know, the, the conspiratorial sort of depths and tunnels. One of the things that ultimately I feel like we're the conspiracy or the, or the truth community, or the red pill community can get caught up is looking around and saying, well, look what happened here. Look what happened here. You know, um, you know, we've got this going on and this going on and we have to expose this person and this person and this person. And I, and I think that there's some truth to that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we've got to be responsible for our own solutions around this stuff. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's where, whether you're kind of in the hashtag me too, or whether you're red pill or whatever these things are, you're going to have to become accountable, responsible for your, for your own personal output and how you will impact the people in the world around you. And, 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 and we, we can't always shake our finger and say, this, this is, what's happened, this isn't fair. Well, of course we know it's not fair. Yeah. Life isn't fair. But at some point, we've got to be able to do something about it. And it's not looking, because what's really interesting, right, is that when somebody comes out and says, this person did this to me, what they're looking for is they're looking for a parental figure in some ways to basically say, Oh, you know, poor, you poor thing. I'm sorry. This person's bad. I'm going to judge this situation. And, and after this, everything's going to be theoretically okay. And it's another instance of having authority basically validate who we are and what our experience is, either good or bad, mm -hmm. positive or negative. And we have to move out of that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because, because we're looking for some externalization whether it's Don Lemon or, who, or, or, or I don't know, Corey, Corey Glover, whoever. And these things ultimately don't matter. They don't matter. These people don't matter. What matters is who we are, how we're able to deal with things, how we're able to transform our lives and become effective people. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten into this situation now where, and it happens on both the left and the right, where we're looking for the externalization of some kind of, of validation around truth and what's happened and who did something wrong and how the hell are you going to make it right? So I feel like this is a time where we're going to have to, you know, face some of that stuff and begin to kind of own our own role in it. Right. And that's about growing up. And I feel like it's, you know, I think it's time. I mean, we've had this extended run since the sixties. 
And now we're going to be in very, very different times. And I, you know, and, and I'm going to say that the, the, the spring, like, I think, you know, I, I really feel like in a lot of ways we're headed into a real winter, not just, not just a, a winter that's going to be predicated by the change of the seasons, but we're headed into a real winter spiritually. And, and I think people need to be prepared for that. So I would say, you know, toughen up a little bit and, and try not to lose your empathy along the way. Oh, okay, I'm done. <laughs> no, I agree with you. And that externalization of like authority, that's another form of disempowerment, right? And with Pluto in the sign of Capricorn and all of that, like, it, I mean, it all plays in and all makes sense because when you're looking to somebody else to fix everything for you or to, you know, distribute justice accordingly and all of that, especially in this system, which is broken and it's not going to happen and the right people are not getting justice in the right ways and it's just not going to the system isn't going to work that way. It just doesn't and never will. We need a new system. Um, but like to give that externalization of authority and have somebody else fix it for you. I mean, that's just another form of disempowerment. So it's ironic. It is so disempowering. Yeah. Right. And so, I mean, taking responsibility for your own life and what you do with the experiences that you've had and even yeah a lot of times they suck and they're not your fault and you know things happen to you and it can be very traumatic and very difficult but not letting that dictate the way that you live your life from here on out right i think yeah. that is a big thing and not making that part of your identity um yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah well we kind of we kind of got off a little bit there but i think yeah, we was, did <laughs> we got I, think it, I think i think it was a good good little exchange you know okay. yeah anything else you see about this this chart um I mean, the main thing is just this Uranus energy, I think is going to be really strong. This is like a big activation of Uranus and Taurus right before Uranus is about to start moving backward and getting back into Aries for the final time. So it's kind of at that volatile point where it's like shifting backwards at zero degrees. And so um, I'm just, I, the, the triggering, the activation of that, I think could cause some sort of disruption um, on like a little bit of a global level. And I think that people might be feeling a little bit scattered and unsettled and all of that. Uh, with that Uranus energy, it brings a lot of frustration up to the surface, right? A lot of need for change, a lot of need to, for liberation. It could be liberation from those disempowering things that we were just talking about, right? Liberating yourself by making changes in your life, uh, changes to your foundation, changes to um, even like your physical foundation, right? Which could be like your home, your resources, your property, like what you have around you on sort of a physical level uh, in order to feel more empowered moving forward. So I think that this is going to be a time where people might be coming to a breaking point. There, there might be some frustration coming up uh, that's yeah. been building for quite some time. And so some people might be making some dramatic changes in their lives, I think, at the end of this month. I think we're going to see a lot of people sort of rearranging and shifting and, and changing. Right. Maybe, maybe a little impulsively or dramatically, but it, it, I think it will happen. <laughs> Could be. And the other thing um, that I think I just want to add to that is, again, based on these planets all being kind of in this transpersonal in the outer, you know, the outer signs. Um, when that happens and there's very little connection with the personal signs, uh, people can feel a bit freaked out and you know, that there's, that there's, you know, these personal areas might feel threatened in some ways. Now that's not to say that everybody's going to feel that way because for some charts, these planets might be in the bottom half of their chart and they could be just fine on some level. Right. But I would say, as a whole, um, that there with that with that cavity or that void, there could be uh, some insecurity because of the open space. Well, just keep in mind that open space is clear space, and you can do things in there. You can create things the way that you want in a lot of ways. So, just uh, just you know, just a little bit of something to think about. Don't get too freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Well, and if you need to make changes in your life and if you're feeling disempowered in different areas of your life, this would be a time when you can make those changes and, you know, feel more secure, more empowered, more stable moving forward, more liberated, right? More free. So this isn't anything scary, I don't think. But yeah, there's there's definitely potential here for some change. So if you're not comfortable with change, it'll maybe be a little uncomfortable for some people who are being especially triggered by this um, opposition going on in the full moon and all that. But yeah, I, I, I like Uranus. Uranus brings like, you know, chaos, but it's like usually the end result of the chaos is positive. So it feels uncomfortable a lot of times in the moment, but usually when I look back on some sort of Uranus transit and what it brought, like the end result is actually great. And I'm very happy that it happened, but you had to go through all of that disruption and discomfort to get there. Well, Uranus is one of, I think of the outer planets. 
I think Uranus is the one planet you can actually participate with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can dance with chaos. You can kind of throw yourself into it. You can be creative. You can change things up. Um, Neptune, not so much. <laughs> Neptune. <laughs> right? Neptune, you just got to surrender and just go with the flow. Like, okay, I'm just going to go with this, see where it's going, and make sure I bolster my faith, or maybe I can be a little creative and have an artistic process around what I'm experiencing. But it's not like you're honest. And then Pluto, forget it. I mean, Pluto, you're just, you know, you're, you're just going to die and be reborn. I mean, that's the nature of Pluto. You face yourself and you don't make deals with Pluto. But Uranus of all the outer planets, mm -hmm. you can, I think there's actually some creative potential. I mean, I think there's creative potential with all three. But I think Uranus, at least for me, is the most easily accessible. But, Absolutely. I, I've definitely noticed the Uranus transits that you can engage with the Uranus transit and make the changes yourself and sort of involve yourself in what's going on. Or if you just sit there, it'll happen to you, and that's going to be a little bit more difficult, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Do you, you want to be in charge of change and, and, and at least have some – kind of say in terms of what it might look like or just wait for it to happen. And I think for most people, they'd like to have, you know, some kind of say over how things are going to um, unfold. Yeah. Speaking of which, should we just like uh, pimp out our webinar one more time before we <laughs> sign off here? Should we sure. give, give yeah. them a little push? Here, let's get out of this screen share and put us on the screen there. Okay. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're doing a webinar and it's on October 20th and it's at, uh, is it 12 noon your time? Is it, uh, is that what it is? It'll be 12 noon in Pacific time, which is my time. And I think that's two o'clock your time. So two o'clock. Right. Yeah. So, so we're, we're doing a joint webinar. And if you like these uh, streams that Heather and I do together on the new moon, then you'll love the webinar uh, because we both bring something unique to the table and um, you'll have plenty of tools to navigate through uh, 20, 2019 with. So that's on your website, your, your mm -hmm. Facebook page. Mm -hmm. and I'll be posting it on Facebook as well and on my website. So there's two ways to go out and uh, to get, get it. Yeah, absolutely. So sign up for the webinar and you can have a very extended version of this. But we're going to get into like all of the different placements. So we'll go through by sign. We'll go through and talk about different aspects from Jupiter and different aspects with the eclipses. I'm going to, I'm making like uh, some reference materials too so you can see where the eclipses will fall in your chart so you can be prepared for the webinar. So um, we're going to get into a lot of detail. We'll do the whole macro thing and we'll go all the way down to how this is going to affect each of you individually. So yeah. I think it's going to be very, very useful in navigating 2019 and even into the beginning of 2020, because a lot of those eclipses are going to still be going on in 2020. And those, were, those are going to be the intense ones. Those so are the ones that are happening in January, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, this has been another great episode with you, Heather. Thanks for uh, being here with, with me today. And thank everybody else for tuning in with us. And um, we look forward to seeing you the next time we do this on the new moon. And um, Heather, where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at astrologywithheather.com. And I think they can find you at robertphoenix.com. <laughs> That's right. And uh, you can find us on the webinar that we're doing on the 20th. And uh, what are we doing with that? We're we using Zoom. Is that we're going to use a Zoom? Yeah, we're using Zoom. So it'll be kind of like how you're seeing it on the screen. We'll be screen sharing. People will be able to raise their hands and interact and ask questions. I'm, I'm setting it up in a really cool way. So it'll be very interactive. And mm -hmm. so you guys will get, get a chance to, you know, pop up on the screen if you want to and ask your questions like live in the webinar. Uh, we'll have Q&A and all of that. So it'll be really good. And everything is captured so you'll be able to go back and listen to it, watch it and reference it. So yeah, good stuff. Okay. Thanks again, Heather. And I'll see you on the next new moon yeah. uh, after we go through all this shocking, these shocking revelations. With <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Uranus conjunction. Okay. Take good care. All right. Bye Robert.